Hybridization gave us our first taste of localized molecular orbital theory, which describes electronic structure in terms of molecular orbitals residing on one or two atoms at most. Molecular orbital theory is the most detailed system we have for describing the electronic structure of molecules, and this is kind of the rock bottom in terms of that deep structure that we talked about for organic chemistry in the very first video of this series. This is the structure underneath the surface that we need to understand organic molecules on a deep level. The beauty of localized molecular orbitals as opposed to the delocalized molecular orbitals that you've probably seen in previous courses is that localized MOs give highly intuitive results for most molecules that fit the Lewis model very well. And furthermore, where they deviate from the Lewis model, we get very clear indications of this and good measures of the energetic consequences of that, as we'll see later. The essence of the localized molecular orbital approach is to start with atomic orbitals on each atom in a structure. Here I'm showing a molecule of acetone as an example. A mathematical procedure puts electrons into these orbitals in such a way that we build the overall wave function for the molecule. And this is done repeatedly using slightly bigger orbitals each time, linear combinations of the smaller orbitals, to construct localized molecular orbitals between pairs of atoms or on a single atom that we call NBOs. And I'll define this acronym in a second. These NBOs answer the question, where are the electrons, in a very intuitive way. They reinforce the Lewis picture, which tells us something already about where electrons are located in molecules. They also give us great insight into how electrons interact within or between molecules. Delocalization effects due to resonance, for example, can be very clearly indicated through this approach via the overlap of adjacent NBOs. The theoretical approach we're going to take here is called natural bond orbital theory. The word natural comes from the fact that as opposed to the delocalized or canonical molecular orbitals that you've seen before, which are based on the integer occupation, in other words, 0, 1, or 2, natural orbitals are based on the electron density of the molecule. The term bond orbital is meant to evoke the idea that these are 1 or 2 atom orbitals. They're localized. They're not spread out over the molecule. As it turns out, this approach works very well to describe the electronic structure of most organic molecules, even those characterized by resonance. Before launching into natural bond orbital theory and localized molecular orbitals, I want to give an analogy to help you understand the difference between the molecular orbital theory you've seen before and the localized MO approach. So what I've done on this slide is just laid down some sticks here, and there are 33 sticks on this slide. There are multiple ways to represent this quantity of 33. We could simply write the number 33 in base 10, which contains a 3 in the 10's place and another 3 in the 1's place. But there's another way to write this quantity in a different numbering system as 100001. These two numbers are equivalent in the sense that they represent the same quantity. And which system we choose to use depends to a large extent on our purposes. If we're working in a computer science context, maybe it's a better idea to represent this number in binary. But if we're working in an everyday life context, it's probably better to just represent the number in base 10. The point is, both numerals, as written, represent the same quantity. Canonical molecular orbital theory, which generates delocalized molecular orbitals even for molecules that don't really experience electron delocalization, is sort of like the base 10 number system. It's useful for some purposes, but there are contexts in which it is not as useful, and as it turns out, organic chemistry is one of those contexts. Binary, which might be a little bit less familiar, is like localized molecular orbital theory and the natural bond orbitals approach. Although it may seem a little bit less familiar, it's highly useful in certain contexts the choice of which MO system we use is to some extent just a matter of convention and what makes the most sense because the two systems are equivalent. They're just two different ways of describing an overall molecular wave function. That wave function is what it is. And we can get that, for example, from a computational chemistry package. The approach we take to understand the content of that wave function, that's where the canonical versus localized approach comes in. For organic chemistry, 
it makes the most sense to use the localized molecular orbital approach. And I hope you see this throughout the course as we return to natural bond orbitals time and time again in discussions of conformation, reactivity, resonance, and many other topics in organic chemistry. Quantum mechanics tells us that molecular systems have to obey the Schrodinger equation. And the process of solving the Schrodinger equation involves first defining the Hamiltonian based on the positions of atoms, and then figuring out what wave functions, capital size, satisfy this equation with E representing the energy of the molecule. And so the main output of solving the Schrodinger equation using software like WebMO, for example, is this psi, capital psi, which is the wave function, describes the properties of all electrons and nuclei within the molecule. But looking at the wave function itself is a problem because it provides information overload. It's too complicated to really interpret the wave function by itself. And so we can take different approaches to express the wave function in terms of simpler functions that are scaled and added together. The primary way we do this is using the so-called canonical approach, where we break the overall molecular wave function down into molecular orbitals, and each molecular orbital corresponds to a specific electron. There's an orbital for electron 1, there's an orbital for electron 2, and so on and so forth. And more or less, the actual math of this is somewhat more complicated, but more or less, we add up these molecular orbital wave functions to give the overall molecular wave function. The important point here is that the canonical MOs represent specific electrons, and since specific electrons can theoretically wander over the entire molecule, these end up delocalized. The pictures we get, or the orbital shapes we get out of a canonical calculation, contain electron density spread out over the entire molecule. And that can be difficult and that can be difficult to interpret, because all it really tells us is that the electrons wandering around the molecule as a whole, not necessarily useful information about where it spends most of its time or where the electron density is highest. That's the beauty of the natural bond orbital approach. Instead of focusing on the individual electrons, the natural bond orbital approach focuses on the electron density and each natural bond orbital is essentially a piece of the overall electron density which I'm representing as rho. As it turns out, most of the electron density in molecules is in the locations we would expect based on Lewis structures. As a result, these natural bond orbitals that come out of this type of analysis tend to look a lot like the hybrids and sigma and pi orbitals that we would expect, that we would expect near bonds within Lewis structures. And so, this is just a different way of representing the wave function that focuses on the electron density where the canonical approach focuses on the fate of individual electrons. And the orbital shapes that come out of the NBO approach, as we've alluded to, are much more intuitive. For example, there might be a sigma bonding orbital between two nuclei where we would expect a sigma bonding orbital to be in the molecule based on the fact that there's a single line connecting the atoms in the Lewis structure. The two approaches are equivalent in the sense that they represent the same overall molecular wave function. This is actually de determined before we even begin to calculate the molecular orbitals. The only strange thing about the natural bond orbital approach, and it's not all that strange, as you'll see when we start looking at some actual results, is that the occupancy of these orbitals based on the electron density can have any value between 0 and 2. It could be 1.3, 1.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0.0 or 2.0. The main reason for that is that each of these orbitals focuses on the electron density, and electron density is a continuous quantity, right? We're not counting electrons, we're looking at how likely an electron is to be within a region of space, and that probability can, in theory, take on any value. Natural bond orbitals are built up mathematically in an intuitive way that involves first combining atomic orbitals to make hybrids, and then combining the hybrids to make natural bond orbitals. Let's take a look at a simple example of how this works for the molecule methane, CH4. The NBO method starts with what are called natural atomic orbitals, which correspond to the atomic orbitals that we would expect for the atoms within the molecule. So for example, there are five of these for carbon, the 1s orbital, the 2s orbital, and the 3 2p orbitals. The method also brings in some higher level atomic orbitals that are unfilled, although these filled orbitals are by far the most important. And the same is true for hydrogen, except for each hydrogen, 
The most important orbital by far is just the 1s orbital. This is the only orbital that's occupied for the hydrogen atoms. The atomic orbitals are then combined to produce natural hybrid orbitals. And the way this works is very similar to the way we've thought about hybridization in the past with mixing or addition of the 2s, 2px, 2py, and 2pz orbitals. What's interesting about the NBO approach, though, is that it allows for non-integer hybridizations. And so to emphasize that, we can write the hybridization using a decimal to show the idea that we actually can have hybridizations like S1.0, P2.9, or 3.5. In the case of methane, the hybridization is very close to the ideal of S1.0, P3.0. To actually accomplish this, there's a coefficient, which I'll denote with the letter C, that goes along with each atomic orbital. And I'll just number them C1 through C5 for each atomic orbital on carbon. Each hybrid orbital, H, is constructed as a weighted sum of the atomic orbitals where the weight is this coefficient ci. And although it's up to the software to determine the exact values of these coefficients, the ultimate result tends to be consistent with chemical intuition, namely the overall hybridization is S1.0 P3.0. We end up with one hybrid orbital per CH bond with the familiar elongated P orbital shape that we've already seen for sp3 hybrids. In fact, the hybrid orbital shapes that I showed in the last video on hybridization were generated using this very method, the NBO approach. In the next step, we combine hybrid orbitals on adjacent atoms to produce the natural bond orbitals. In the case of methane, hybridization is unnecessary at the hydrogen atoms, and so each natural bond orbital can be thought of as involving overlap of one of the sp3 hybrids at carbon with a 1s orbital on hydrogen. The constructive combination in which the signs of the orbitals match where they overlap, is a bonding orbital and just has the appearance of an enlarged sp3 hybrid, since overlap of the 1s orbital with this hybrid really just enlarges the larger lobe. It does have a slight effect on the little nub in contracting it, since the sign of this little nub is the opposite of the sign of the 1s orbital on hydrogen. This is a sigma bonding combination and we can think about constructing it mathematically in the same way we thought about constructing the hybrids. It's just that now we're using the hybrids as input and assigning coefficients to these. So we might have, for example, a coefficient for the sp3 hybrid, and the resulting sigma orbital we can think of as that coefficient times the wave function or orbital for the hybrid, plus a coefficient for the 1s orbital on the hydrogen times the atomic wave function for the 1s orbital. Notice that the basic idea here in constructing natural bond orbitals fits the same paradigm of we're summing on pairs of adjacent atoms coefficients times the wave functions, typically hybrids, but can be atomic orbitals for hydrogen, as we've seen, associated with that orbital. Since two orbitals are going into this, two orbitals are coming out, and the combination where we subtract instead of add results in an antibonding orbital. If we switch the phase of the hydrogen's 1s orbital so that it doesn't match the phase of the hybrid where the two meet, the resulting combination contains a node between the nuclei and a somewhat larger lobe outside of the bond on the carbon side. This is an antibonding combination that we can think of as the difference now between the product of the sp3 orbital and its coefficient and the hydrogen 1s orbital times its coefficient. The way the NBO method works, all of these descriptions of the orbital situation are actually valid ways to describe the wave function as a whole. The beauty of the natural bond orbital approach is that we can associate this shape with the Lewis structural element of a single bond. And when we look at the occupancies, although the occupancies can vary from exactly 0 or 2, we get a result where the occupancy is darn near 2.0 in the case of the bonding orbital and darn near 0 in the case of the antibonding orbital. These results are a testament to the power and utility and validity of the Lewis model in describing chemical bonding in the methane molecule. What's more, the orbital shapes and the quantitative information in the form of these coefficients provides us with useful information that's easy to interpret because it's chemically meaningful. You'll see this as we apply natural bond orbital theory to explain various phenomena in organic molecules throughout the semester.